Hello, Mr. Hovind. I hope you're enjoying your time back in Pensacola after committing a rather serious crime involving taxes, a crime apparently worth of a decade served. I'm sure many of us, yes, even your naysayers, missed you dearly. Unfortunately, it seems that there are some things that still need to be worked out on your end before your ideas can truly take off in academia. And this video will attempt to illuminate for you these problems that your naysayers have tried to tell you in the past. The particular topic of this video is about your views on biological evolution, particularly regarding the modern synthesis of evolutionary theory. However, instead of the approach that many before me have taken to enlighten you on what evolutionary theory is and what it predicts in the most general sense, I will instead show you how we know that populations of animals and other life forms can be unified in a nested hierarchy, just from simple deduction, in an effort to show you why one of your favorite words is of no real value. Once you've shown why this word does not mean anything, you'll then realize how intuitive evolutionary theory as a whole really is. So, can you tell me what this animal is, Mr. Hoven? Would you agree with me that this is an ostrich? Here's a question then, how exactly do we know that this is an ostrich? After all, the word ostrich is just a label that we give to this living organism that has certain characteristics. If a living thing does not have the characteristics necessary to denote the label ostrich, then it can't be an ostrich, wouldn't you agree? So what characters does this creature have that makes it worthy of the label ostrich? For starters, it has cells that contain the nucleus, but so does a lot of other things, so there must be more than that. Ostriches must be multicellular eukaryotic organisms, but again, so are a lot of other living things, so we must become more and more restrictive of our definition by tackling on more necessary characteristics to fulfill the criteria of being an ostrich. Only then would we be able to say with reasonable certainty that this particular creature is indeed an ostrich. For the sake of argument, let's call an ostrich not just this particular creature, but everything closely related to it as well. But wait, how closely related do they need to be? As most of us realize, offspring of a sexually reproductive species are not usually identical to their parents. There is always going to be variation as long as mutations and independent assortment can occur. So my next question is, should the slightly different child of a creature that fulfills the definition of being an ostrich also be called an ostrich? It certainly has the majority, if not all, of the traits necessary, yet it still has the differences that makes its particular genetic code unique to itself as just one individual of its species, wouldn't you agree? We must then find the traits or the trait that we can use as a final determinant to decide if it indeed belonged to this arbitrary group called ostriches and anything that fits into this group should thus be called an ostrich, regardless of the uniqueness that they do have. This is just like saying that the domestic dog, wolf, dingo, and jackals all fulfill the criteria of being called dogs, while still being unique because of extra traits that they have that differentiates themselves from the other creatures called dogs. This type of grouping is called a nested hierarchy, and placing creatures in groups that contain other groups is called the rule of nested hierarchy. This rule of nested hierarchies can be applied to our ostrich example, Despite all of the children of the things that we call ostriches having their own variations, they still fulfill our definition of an ostrich, so they are part of the ostrich group. What if we compared the things in the ostrich group to other living things that are no doubt similar to the ostrich group? Surely these things have traits unique to themselves, so they shouldn't all be called ostriches, yet they have much more traits in common than they have differences. Because of these similarities, we can put all of these creatures into a bigger group called ratites, or simply large flightless birds. Keep in mind that I have implied any sort of evolutionary theory into this classification scheme. I'm simply grouping these creatures that have similar characteristics into one group, which helps us quite a bit to describe exactly what this specific creature ought to be called, such that if we know what large flightless birds are, then we can simply add more restrictive characteristics to our criteria that makes the ostrich different from other large flightless birds. We call this group the large flightless birds, but what about other flightless birds that aren't large, like penguins? They're most certainly birds, and they're flightless. They only differ in their sizes and lifestyle. So if I may, Mr. Hoven, would you disagree with me if I put the penguins, the ratites, and all other creatures with feathered wings yet cannot fly into one big category called the flightless birds? Would you then disagree with me, Mr. Hoven, that the flightless birds are part of an even bigger group called modern birds that have all of these characteristics up to the point of having feathers and a toothless beak? I'm sure most people, including you, Mr. Hoven, have no problems with this grouping where everything that has the characteristics of eukaryotic cells, multicellularity, tissues, etc., up to having feathers and a toothless beak, fit the definition of a bird, so they all ought to be called birds. Question then, Mr. Hoven, is this a bird? This creature certainly has a skeleton that resembles a bird, and we can even see traces of its feathers around its entire body in a pattern we would expect from every creature we put together in the bird group. 
One of the most noticeable features of this creature would probably be its teeth within what looks like a primitive beak. Surely no modern birds have this feature, having a toothless beak instead. So this creature should be in a group outside of modern birds, but it still has many more similarities than it does differences. So perhaps, if I may, Mr. Hoven, I can place this creature, called Archaeopteryx, into a group that includes other things with a bird-like skeleton and feathers, which would also include the previously established bird group. This is another example of a nested hierarchy. Let's call this new group the Maniraptors, meaning hand snatchers, for their long claws. Keep in mind that I'm not calling anything outside of the bird group birds. I'm simply placing similar creatures into groups based on the characteristics that they share. So at this point, I've defined this all-encompassing group of creatures called Maniraptors to include anything that has the characteristics that an ostrich would have up to the point of having a bird-like skeleton and feathers. This group would also include the previous groups we established, because since we're looking for the correct label to call this creature, we must narrow down all the traits necessary to define it, and in the process of doing so, we go through increasingly exclusive groups of creatures with ever-increasing similarity. So here's another question, Mr. Hoven. Is this creature a dinosaur? Let's look at its characteristics. It's bilaterally symmetrical, it has a spinal column, it has calcified bones, it has jaws, it has two legs and two arms, it probably had lungs, it probably had scales, it laid amniotic eggs, it has claws, it has a diapsid skull, it has bipedality, and finally, it has feathers. Given all of these characteristics, it certainly fits into the Manoraptor group we've made. So if this thing meets the requirements necessary to be called a dinosaur, then that means either everything that falls outside of the creature's groups cannot be dinosaurs, or all Manoraptors are dinosaurs. So what defines a dinosaur? It turns out that all it takes to define a dinosaur is any creature with a diapsid skull and a hole between the bones of the pelvic girdle. This is how we know that sauropods, theropods, and ceratopsians are dinosaurs, while marine reptiles and pterosaurs are not. So does our mystery creature fit this definition of a dinosaur? Quite certainly. It turns out to be a velociraptor. It's not part of the modern bird group, but it does belong to a group that includes modern birds. A better question is, do any of the other creatures in our manoraptor group fit this definition of a dinosaur? Yes, indeed. In fact, any creature part of the manoraptor group we made would fit this definition of a dinosaur, which, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Hoven, would include birds. This is how we know that birds are dinosaurs, because they simply meet the definition of a dinosaur, and any creature that gets sorted out in our attempt to specifically define birds from other groups are called transitional forms, which is why both Velociraptor and Archaeopteryx are called transitionals between dinosaurs and birds. They are encountered as we go through the nested hierarchies that contain the bigger group dinosaurs and the smaller group modern birds. I understand that this may cause a bit of cognitive dissonance for you, Mr. Hoven. Please remember that I did not attempt to spin anything to make it turn out this way. I simply looked at a creature, illuminated its characteristics, grouped it with other creatures based on how similar they were, and gave each grouping an arbitrary label to make it easier to know what characteristics they have. Doing so is precisely what allows me to say that ostriches are ratites, ratites are flightless birds, flightless birds are birds, birds are manoraptors, and, as we've now shown, manoraptors are dinosaurs. Since Manoraptors are dinosaurs, everything inside the Manoraptor group are dinosaurs, which then means everything inside the bird group are dinosaurs. And voila, we have just derived the modern scientific consensus that birds are dinosaurs, and this is all that we need to show that ostriches are not only ratites, but they are also dinosaurs. This is why, Mr. Hoven, your favorite word, kinds, has no bearing in reality, because the groups that taxonomists and other biologists use to group things together are created based solely on the observable traits had by the creatures they compare. This same methodology that led us to conclude that birds are dinosaurs also leads us to conclude that humans are apes, that apes are monkeys, that monkeys are primates, that primates are mammals, and so on. And this, in effect, creates the very evolutionary tree of life that is corroborated by the fields of genetics, paleontology, paleoanthropology, and everything else in biology and beyond. Looking at the broader picture, all of the groups that we can consistently create by comparing characteristics is navigated by simply adding new characteristics to a group's definition, in order to come to a very specific creature that undoubtedly fits the most stringent definitions that can be verified. This also demonstrates that new groups, and by extension new species, can appear by a creature developing a new trait that differentiates it from the others. For example, if we have two mammals that give birth by laying an egg, they may be placed into a group under the title egg-laying mammals, or monotremes. However, suppose that one of the creatures inherited a mutation from its parents that made it skip the egg-laying and kept the egg inside the mother instead. 
Now it has a new trait that we can use to create a new group within our starting mammal group, indicating a nested hierarchy. In this scenario, creatures with all of the characteristics needed to define a mammal must also be accounted for how they give birth, and doing so will land them in either the egg-laying mammals or the live-bearing mammals. Despite this differentiation between prototheria and theria, they are still part of the mammal group because they still meet the definition of a mammal, only now they are a specific type of mammal depending on their birthing mechanisms, just like how humans are just a specific type of ape, apes are just a specific type of monkey, monkeys are a specific type of primate, and so on. This is how evolutionary changes begin, Mr. Hoven. With every generation of any living creature showing variation, that variation can give us the opportunity to group that creature into one group with other creatures, and at the same time, differentiate it into different groups with more similar creatures. This is how we can empirically demonstrate not only that one group is part of a larger group, but also that one group can give rise to new groups, which is precisely what evolutionary theory predicts, describing the biodiversity of life. Mr. Hoven, if you want to disprove evolution, you must somehow show us that variation cannot cause the creation of new taxonomic groups based on a new character traits that can be measured. Show us how one can define a group based on its verifiable characters while also deliberately excluding a group that very clearly fits the definition. Only then will your favorite term kinds will be of merit, because there's no such thing as a bird kind as opposed to a dinosaur kind because both the fossil record and taxonomic analysis, in addition to genetics, geology, and other disciplines in the natural sciences, indicate all species in these groups to be related simply because they fit the definitions of the groups that unite them. The only way you can escape this is to be inconsistent, which is most certainly not scientific.